Well, was it fact or fiction? We test the Da Vinci Code myth tonight at 8. But first on 5, we're in Florence as Brian Saul continues his grand tour. This is the very road on which grand tourists travelled the 50 miles from Bologna to Florence in the 18th century. It winds through the Apennine Mountains. The grand tourists went perhaps 30 miles at most in a day. But coming over these hills, not only were the roads rutted, there was no paving. You were over raw earth which in summer kicked up hideous dust and in winter was muddy. Passengers actually had to get off and walk. So any idea of covering 30 miles in a day was uh, just out. The road's many villages provided hostelries in which to spend the night on flea-ridden mattresses stuffed with filthy straw and be overcharged for abominably nasty food. In one of them, William Beckford, though the richest boy in Britain, was offered no alternative to crow's gizzards and mustard for his dinner. Once over these hills and descending into what was then the Grand Duchy of Tuscany, the unseasonably bitter weather changes. The sun shines, birds sing, and it is spring. Exactly what should have happened when weeks ago I crossed the Alps. Turin, Milan, Cremona, Bologna, great cities all, but they pale into insignificance compared with Florence. We've just come south from Bologna, over the mountains, snow on one side, the warm south on the other, and as you crest the hill at Fiesole, you see spread before you in a saucer valley, the great city of Florence. Your father, your uncles, your grandfather has told you of this view. But you cannot imagine it. Only when you see it do you realize how beautiful it is. As one young grandee put it, if I see nothing else in Italy, my journey is repaid by this one glorious sight. From Fiesole, the young lord's carriage clattered down into the city that rivaled Rome as the most important cultural site in Italy. Byron declared himself drunk with its beauty. Florence was the birthplace and burial place of Michelangelo, the greatest artist of the Renaissance. It was the city governed by the Medici, the family that had grown from pawnbrokers to grand dukes, become cardinals and popes, and it was the city in which Horace Mann, British envoy to the Medici, kept open house for British visitors. The building that dominates all views of Florence is the Duomo, the cathedral, that with its freestanding baptistry and bell tower, we now see as a great monument of the early Renaissance. But the grand tourist had scant interest in anything so early. Contemporary architecture and the ruins of ancient Rome were his educated and acquired tastes, and he visited the Duomo not as a work of art, but as a curiosity. No part of it was more curious than the dome, the engineering masterpiece of Filippo Brunelleschi, who died in 1446, whose great monument this is. The diameter was too great for any scaffold, and no one quite knows how, without it, he constructed this unique dome. Yeah. 
The first surprise is the view of the interior, painted crudely by Giorgio Vasari, huge, Michelangelo's younger friend and earliest biographer. This encyclopedic view of the Last Judgment, the bodily resurrection of the dead, their welcome into heaven, and their dragging down to hell, seems a thing of dramatic medieval horror at which a young Protestant my lord might laugh. It was, of course, an opportunity for Vasari to imitate the great nudes of his hero, Michelangelo, or to rival Correggio's dissolution of the architecture of the cathedral dome in Palma, but in both he failed, failed utterly. The anatomy of his striving figures artificial, his expressions and sub-narratives grotesque, all ranged in concentric rings about the dome, an old Florentine convention. Vasari's most grandiose work reveals how weak he was. When Brunelleschi built the cathedral, he had no idea how he was going to put the dome on, and he managed to do it without building a timber framework. And he worked out a system of concentric circles, bricks, each changing very slightly the angle as they get further in. And so to climb up the inner skin of the dome, you have to bend your head to accommodate the sloping, increasingly sloping angle of the outer skin of the dome. Very strange experience. On the other side of this slope is the last judgment that we saw a few moments ago. And above here are the tiles that are so visible for miles on any view of Florence. How did Brunelleschi do it? And we still don't know. And everybody assumes that Brunelleschi sat down and worked it out and then did it. My supposition is that he did indeed work some things out with a pen and drawings, but that it's an ad hoc solution to every point. And I think that Brunelleschi was up here every day while the dome was being done. He knew precisely what he was doing. He would look at something and say, that is likely to split unless we lay the bricks this way in a rising herringbone. If we look up here, right up to the top, and you can see the people at the apex of the dome, we shall go on. Up here, 50 years ago, there was really nothing to restrain you from the invisible force that draws you over the edge of things to great height. There was only this bar. None of this was here. It's really a very strange, compelling feeling to move closer and closer to the edge and just slip into oblivion. From the magnificent marble lantern that tops the dome, Florence is laid out like a model for a bird's eye view, and we can weave our way through the dark alleys across the River Arno to the vast Pitti Palace. This ugly, heavily rusticated prison of a palace was once prettier and smaller, but when the Medici bankrupted the Pitti family for whom it had been built, they assumed ownership and half a dozen architects were commissioned over centuries to make it what it was. A palace for the Medici Grand Dukes and ultimately for the first king of a united Italy. One visiting Englishman described it as the most magnificent pile in Christendom and another thought the paintings within it the best he ever saw.
Raphael, Titian, Correggio, Rubens. These masters of the High Renaissance and Baroque hang together, frame to frame. But you will look in vain for Fra Angelico and Botticelli, for these early Renaissance painters were out of fashion in the 18th century and to the taste of neither the Grand Dukes nor the Grand Tourist. Gosh. Well, now I know why Louis XIV built Versailles. Medici was his grandmother, and she must have told him about this. Actually, it's twice as wonderful as bits of Versailles. And look at that. Feast your eyes on it. No wonder Louis built Versailles. Hmm. We've seen the grandeur of the Pitti Palace from outside. We've seen the grandeur of the Pitti Palace within. But now I want to show you something much less grand, though to us it will seem quite grand enough. It is a small room, it is the bedroom of the last Grand Duke of the real Medici. He was a great eccentric. Amongst other things, he did not care for women. He cared for them so little that he couldn't even try to sire an heir. And for the last ten years or so of his life, he knew that he was the last of the line, that there was no other Medici to come. And so, in a sense, he gave up. He said, I shall enjoy the life I want to lead. I've always wanted and retired to his bed. His bed was in that alcove where there is now an altar. He woke at midday, the clocks of Florence chiming long. And in at that very moment, through that door, came a donkey bearing panniers of fruit, peaches and grapes, and the languid hand of Gian Gastone would reach out of his bed, still half asleep, and pluck a peach from the basket, and juice dribbling down his chin, make breakfast of it. Nothing much else happened for another five hours, and then at five o'clock in the afternoon it was dinner time, and in came dinner and the Ruspanti. Now, the Ruspanti, I have to explain, were named after a worthless coin, the equivalent in Florence of a farthing, the Ruspo. And they were so named because they were worthless boys, all boys, naughty boys, lascivious boys, willing boys. And they ate their dinner and they cavorted around the bed and they entertained the Grand Duke. It was an extraordinary entertainment to which the occasional young grand tourist was a witness. Imagine, you're 18 or so, 19, 20 perhaps. You've been to Eton, so you are not entirely unaware of what is going on. But to find that it is the formal entertainment of one of the grandest courts in Europe, far grander than anything the Hanoverians could provide, was quite astonishing. 370 naughty young men attended the funeral of John Gastone, the last of the great Grand Dukes. Not much lamented by the people of Florence, but lamented by the odd visiting Englishman, one of whom said that it was a tragedy that the last of the educated Medici had gone, because it meant that Florence declined, moldered into a state of nothingness when it had once been powerful and wonderful. 
He was replaced by a cadet branch of the Medici, the Lorrainers. And they came into this palace and they left it much as they found it, except for this bedroom, in which such unspeakable things had been done that it could not be borne. And so they wiped the slate clean. Out went the bed, out went the chamber pot, and in came the altar piece. And there it still is. A sad reminder of how religion manages to spoil absolutely everything. Florence lies astride the Arno, much more to the north than to the south, just like London in the 18th century. And the most famous bridge linking these unequal halves is this, the Ponte Vecchio, the old bridge. Now made shoddy by souvenir shops, it is, like the dome, a point of blind pilgrimage for tourists. But grand tourists crossed it too. Ever neglectful of the social graces, I have forgotten to introduce you to my flannel Prudence. Prudence is this piece of flannel stretched over my shoulders against the bitter wind. Young grand tourists were advised to bring a flannel Prudence with them from England to protect them against unseasonable changes in the weather. Just such a change is happening now. I'm standing on the Ponte Vecchio in Florence and the wind is as bitter as the wind on the Bosporus in winter. The view is beautiful, and I see hundreds of tourists pass before me, glancing neither left nor right, looking for souvenirs or other tourists, or God knows what, but not the view. Grand tourists, however, came here for the view. Grand tourists stood where I am standing and looked downstream at palaces, flanking the river. The bridge is part of the covered way that once connected the Pitti Palace with the offices of the Medici. How the pawnbrokers had flourished. We in the world now know these offices as the Uffizi, the great museum of Florentine and other paintings, commissioned, bought, taken as pledges perhaps by the Medici and either unfashionable or too many to be hung in their living quarters in the Pitti Palace. For all the travails and discomforts of the journey so far, there was one magnificent compensation. It was this room, the tribuna, in which the Grand Dukes of Tuscany had their great collection of paintings and antique sculpture. In this room, there were crowded frame to frame paintings by Rubens, René, Raphael by the half dozen. Most of the pictures have changed, and our impression of the room as it was at the end of the 18th century is formed largely by a painting done by Johann Zoffany late in the century. Here's Horace Mann, the presiding genius of English visitors to Florence, the man who could have organized such a gathering of tourists. And they are all having a debate, poking, prodding, touching things. And the main debate was over a picture that isn't in this room, but I shall take you to it in a moment. Petition called the Venus of Urbino, a young woman, stark naked, lying on a bed. The debate was whether as men excited sexually by art, they would rather take the Titian girl to bed or the Medici Venus. 
The Medici of Venus usually won the debate. They thought the front of her beautiful, but one tourist said, however beautiful you think her breasts, go round to the back and look at her buttocks, for there you will see a bottom as defies imagination. It did not, judging from its sticky grubbiness, defy the urge to touch. Just look at Titian's Venus. She is no goddess, but a girl of 17. She is a Venetian courtesan. It is afterwards. Her lover has gone. She lies, provoking us, kisses lying heavy on her shoulder and her neck. Eye contact, deliberate. Look at her eyes. Look at her disheveled hair. This is a girl who is provoking you. She is already sated, but she is ready for you too. How could the boys prefer the other Venus? This is where the English love affair with Tuscany began. Standing in this rather drab back street, a few yards from the army, is the little palace that belonged to Horace Mann. Horace, staring at Titian's Urbino Venus, was British envoy to the Medici for half a century, a genial host who kept open house for British visitors and when too many came, trained his servants to run four hotels, furnished in the English manner, chamomile tea supplied. The land on which the palace is built belongs to the Frescobaldis, an ancient Florentine family. And I'm about to discuss old Horace with the Marchesa. The Marchesa took me at once into the garden where she is attempting to recreate the grottoes and secret places that were the delights of Horace's day. His celebrated or notorious palazzo parties overflowed into the garden, which was lit and furnished like the pleasure gardens at Vox Hall, a perfect place for assignation and sexual encounter. A generous host, but a fiddle-faddle of a man, a wet brown paper of a man. He was what the married 18th century gentleman mocked as an amphibian and had an eye for pretty boys. It, it must have been great fun running a household to which people of whom you knew but did not know were constantly coming, knocking on your door and saying, entertain me. Well, it's in a, a way, I must say that this does happen in Florence quite, quite often. I mean, it happens to me the whole time, and, and I love it. <laughs> I think possibly like many people who are expatriate, he actually needed the constant feeding of people from England so that gossip, could flow in both directions. In both directions, sure. And I, th I think by nature he was a gossip. There are sayings that he was a kind of a spy, I'm afraid, because he was so interested in whatever was going on here. And people thought that he was asking too many questions and he wanted to know too many things. Horace was indeed a spy reporting to Hanoverian masters the activities of exiled Stuarts. And Bonnie Prince Charlie himself lived in Florence for a while and attracted many British sympathizers. Taking my leave of the Marchesa, I go in search of higher things, none loftier in the 18th century than Michelangelo. Florence is littered with ghastly souvenirs of his great David, and a copy stands outside the Palazzo Vecchio, the ancient heart of the city. But we shall concentrate on the original. Is any sculpture better known than Michelangelo's David? 
David represents for the city of Florence and had done for at least a hundred years a heroic image of a small state against states much larger and more powerful. David, the boy who killed the giant Goliath. The traditional iconography is David with his foot on the severed head of the giant, the victory victorious. What Michelangelo has done is rather different. He gives us not an ordinary boy, as predecessors like Donatello had, but to make what one 19th century English writer described as a gigantic hobbledehoy. Simmons, when he said that, recognized the truth of this sculpture, the realism of it. It is a boy, a boy who is adolescent, who is not full grown, who has narrow shoulders and big hands and feet, who has the awkwardness about him of true adolescence. He gives us a boy who is pensive, who knows that on his shoulders so much depends he must be victorious. This is the moment before the slingshot that kills the giant. A slack hand, a hand about to do something dramatic. The David for centuries stood here in the great lodger on the right that is now wrapped in plastic rightly resembling a work of contemporary art. This is where the grand tourists saw it. But some hundred years ago, showing signs of pollution, it was moved to the Academia. As a result, it risks becoming a sterile museum piece, its marble muscles mortified without the nourishment of changing sunlight. It's flattened by the light. You're not urged go around it. There's nothing we can do about that, but we can show you how grand tourists looked at it. Imagine when on the open loggia of the Piazza della Signoria we can walk around it with our flaming brand illuminating not only the statue, but the darkness, throwing shadows. Look at the hair in this flickering light. Look at the limbs in this flickering light. This is how young grand tourists enjoyed looking at sculpture. Imagine if we could see this sculpture as we should. Fascinated by the life and work of Michelangelo, the young milords made the pilgrimage here, too, to the church of Santa Croce. Luckily for them, though, they did not have to suffer this outrageous facade. It could be classified as late wedding cake or early water closet. It fits perfectly with both, for its date, insofar as you can see it, <laughs> is about 1850, and it was paid for by an Englishman called Sloane. It's a perfect piece of Victorian Gothic with Italian um, overtones. It reminds me both of the shopping centre at Hammersmith and the Albert Memorial outside the Albert Hall. It is hideous beyond belief. However, behind it lies an ancient Gothic church of some grandeur. And a church indeed so large and so grand that the Florentines for centuries buried their great men in it. And it is one of those to whom I have come to say farewell. Machiavelli is here, 
Bruni and Alfieri too, and Dante is honoured with a monument. But most visitors to this echoing cavern of a church have come to see the tomb of Michelangelo. He is buried here in a tomb designed by his friend and biographer, Giorgio Vasari. Vasari should have known better. It is a terrible tomb. It is topped by a rotten piece of painting by Naldini. The bust of Michelangelo is a copy of a copy of a copy of a bust of Michelangelo. Below it, there is a sarcophagus with three figures that represent painting, sculpture, and architecture. They are so bad, they make me angry. Michelangelo is the greatest of all artists. And in the David, in the Academia, we saw what he did when he was very young. That gives you a measure of the man who is, I may say, dishonored by this tomb. I should, perhaps, be sorry for Vasari. Michelangelo, long before, had set such an example in the art of the funerary monument as could never have been equaled. He designed a chapel for a pair of Medici dukes, a complex harmony of architecture, exquisite in detail, mathematically proportionate, and in it set tombs, effigies, and sculptures that have echoed down the centuries, even into my lifetime. I came here as a student 50 years ago, and as a student had certain expectations which had been generated by much poring over photographs. Young grand tourists did not have that advantage. Both of us, I think, were surprised, I by the inadequacy of photography, and the young grand tourist by the magnificence that is revealed as one goes through this door. From this doorway, one is tilted towards this wall, containing a tomb that is so familiar. It's Giuliano de' Medici, a man portrayed here as one of fierce activity, a military man. The head comes from the David, an ideal in Michelangelo's imagination. Giuliano de' Medici, is flanked at his feet by night and day. For this Medici, things were either black or white. They were positive, they were dark or light. For the other Medici, it's rather different. Here you have a man of poetic and philosophical inclinations. Michelangelo does that extraordinary thing of giving him a magnificent headdress and shadowing his face. The hand goes to the mouth. You hardly see what he looks like. And at his feet, you have the half-times. Dawn, not daylight. You have evening, not darkness. And constantly surprised by Michelangelo. He can be as familiar as an apple or an orange, and you suddenly see him anew, and things happen. You see him with the eyes of Rubens. You see him with the eyes of all the great painters who came into this room. They sat on the floor with their sketchbooks on their knees and drew these figures. These figures influence for centuries the development of the history of art. You are in a key moment in the history of sculpture, the history of painting, the history of architecture. There was a man of such genius at such an early stage in his life that there has never been anybody who could match it. Not Raphael, 
Raphael was an affected weakling compared with Michelangelo. Leonardo, Leonardo was a, a, a genius who wasted his time on fripperies and achieved nothing, painted a dozen pictures at best, and has left us lots of drawings, but no great works of art. Michelangelo knew what he was doing and did it. Michelangelo had such a sense of purpose and yet was a man of extraordinary imagination and could write poetry and be affectionate to both men and women in an ideal sense. I think it was, ah, I think he was a driven soul, but it was a soul imbued with Genius. Only one physical thing could requite the mood of exaltation inspired by Michelangelo. Those who have flown in a balloon have experienced the sudden separation from the clamor all about us on the ground, the solitude, peace. Only they will know exactly what I mean. memory does not defeat me. The man who brought ballooning to London late in the 18th century was Italian, not French, and certainly not Montgolfier. That's it. That's it. My compliment. And few people know that. He, he, he set up just such a balloon as I am in, um, in Belgravia, oh, yeah. more or less where Belgravia Square is now. And off they went towards Hyde Park with a very, very fat English woman in the basket. She was so fat, she defeated the flight. Exactly. It's true. No, it's my, my great compliment. <laughs> yeah, really. Really, I really appreciate that because many, many people don't know oh, nothing well, about it. Yeah. They think always that Montgolfier brothers no, no, did everything. No, no, no. They no, never flew. No, 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 no. It was an Italian who came to England and said, this is how you fly a balloon. And, of course, everybody flocked to it as a great entertainment. So, in the later part of the century, when grand tourists came to Italy, this was quite possibly something that they sought out and tried to do. So, flying over Florence is not as mad as it may seem. Is that the old road to Siena? Or is yeah, it is. exactly. Good. It's Via Senesi, Certosa, and then uh, the, the motorway to Siena. Yes, we shan't take the motorway, but we shall take that road when we leave Florence. In taking us along the old road to Siena, the wind was prescient. A couple of days later, I was back on it, pretending that my Mercedes is a horse-drawn carriage musing on the comfortable reputation of the women there. And stay with us as Brian Saul also helps separate the facts from the fiction as we examine the Da Vinci Code myth in just a moment. Mm -hmm. 